So I'm here to talk about uh, Vespo, which is sort of at the end of the big data ecosystem. First you collect data, you analyze it and so on, but sooner or later, hopefully you do some serving to end users and Vespa is all about that as I'll, as I'll talk about. So we call it uh, big data serving engine. Uh, that was my nice slide created by a designer, rest is mine. Uh, when you start out with big data, right? You have lots of data, but you don't know what you should use the data for. That's what I call a latent stage. And then you start using it for analysis where humans uh, look at the data and use it to inform their decision-making, right? At some point, uh, you start learning automatically from the data, which is where most of the current big data stack is, uh, or most of the action is, right? Where you have Hadoop and all the machine learning tools and so on. Um, but at some point, in most use cases, you want to get to the acting phase where you make decisions in real time based on your data, right? Uh, there's two kinds of so categories of decisions you may want to make. It's where you can make decisions based on just looking at a single data item at a time. That would be a streaming application if what you're looking at is a stream of data coming in, right? Or if it is something that originates from a user, uh, but you only need to look at a single data point to make a decision, then it's what we call stateless model serving, where we have things like TensorFlow serving and so on, right? And those use cases is not what Vespa do. Vespa is doing the other harder thing, which is you want to make decisions in real time based on selecting from big data sets and evaluating machine learned models over lots of data points while the user is waiting, so with really low latency. That's the problem that uh, Vespa is built to solve. So what do you need, really need to do to solve that uh, kind of use case, right? Obviously you need to make, take actions in real time. So you need to be able to respond with really low latency, typically less than hundred milliseconds, because we know that if users start waiting for more than something like 400 milliseconds, they get uh, annoyed. Um, in most cases, you also want your data to be up to date, which translates to handling a high sustained write rate to the data you are making decisions over. Um, and because there's lots of users, hopefully, of your system, and you have lots of data, you need to be able to scale in those, styles, those two dimensions. Um, and because we can never be down if we serve end users, we need a system to be highly available, and that means we need to be able to recover automatically from hardware failures, redistribute data, route around failures, all that kind of thing. And we need to be able to evolve these kind of systems uh, while we're online, while we're handling the queries, handling the right traffic and so on. We need to be able to change schemas, change the business logic of the system, change the machine learn models, change the hardware and so on, all while we are serving without disrupting any query traffic or wipes. And because this kind of system needs to be part of the larger uh, big data ecosystem where you have things like Hadoop and Spark and so on for offline processing of data and TensorFlow and other tools for machine learning and so on, this system needs to be integrated with those. So that's what Vespa uh, does for you. Uh, it's an open source platform for what we call big data serving, which is what I just described. Uh, it actually comes from the same group, larger group anyway, that this also started developing Hadoop. And it was for solving a, big, a different part of the same use case, which was uh, web search. I view web search as the prototypical use case for these kind of uh, systems because you have, since you index all the web, you index lots and lots of data, right? And because the queries comes from end users. There's no way you can pre-compute the right answer to all the queries up front. So you need to do all your computation over all your data in real time while the user is waiting, right? 
And back when we started doing web search, we didn't have any technologies that could solve this problem. So we had to build all these technologies ourselves. And two of the systems we built were uh, Hadoop and Vespa. Uh, we haven't been able to open source Vespa until late last year because of the very interesting IP rights situation in the search world, which I won't go into, but uh, it's not an easy thing to do. But we have finally managed to do it, which is great, because it means this platform is now available to everyone. So just a few words, so how you use it, uh, Oat and Yahoo. Yahoo is now part of a larger company called Outright, which includes other things like Tumblr and TechCrunch and AOL and whatnot. Um, so we have about 140 applications of uh, Vespa over there, obviously all the traditional text search use cases, but a bigger chunk of the use cases is personalization. For example, if you go to the front page of Yahoo or Yahoo Finance or News or Sports or whatever, you get a list of articles and those articles are personalized for each user. And we don't do it in the complex and expensive way people used to do this, which is to pre-compute all the personalization, all the recommendations for each possible user offline on Hadoop first and then serve those uh, lists. We compute it on the fly based on a tensor describing the user, which we feed to machine learn model that is evaluated over uh, all the articles and videos and so on as we have. And we do that on the fly um, in Vespa. So every time you visit this page is a query to Vespa that uh, does that for you to compute the best articles for you, or at least best according to the models of the scientists. Another, app, another application of this, which is similar, is the native ads that are in this stream and used on many other pages as well, which is also another application of Vespa, which is similar, but has an additional twist, which is there's online bidding uh, and billing of these ads going on all the time, right? And you need to keep track of the budget of each advertisers in real time. So every time somebody view uh, these ads, we update the index in this entire Vespa system to deduct the money that is now spent by the advertiser. So we do all those updates in uh, real time. So overall on Vespa, we do a couple of hundred thousand queries per second on these systems. This, this number is a bit old and too low. Um, yeah, so it's quite heavily used. There are some other companies that have started using it uh, as well, but I don't, I, there's not too many I can speak about uh, publicly. Um, yeah, so let's move on. So in some more detail, what can Vespa do for you? It can do uh, the traditional and structured text search where you have a text query and you have text. Uh, documents and you do a traditional search. You can also do structured search or structured data and you can combine these two things uh, as you like in the same query. It can do relevant scoring both using the traditional natural language kind of scoring that we do in web search but also using more advanced machine learn models like TensorFlow models, models saved in ON and X which is a common format for most of the other tools that are not uh, TensorFlow like cafe and so on. Um, it can do query time organization and aggregation of all the data that is matching query. So distributed or all the nodes, you can run distributed algorithms in real time that groups the data and count values and so on, uh, order data and return all of that. Um, and it can do all this while it's handling real time writes at a high sustained rate. So typically, uh, couple of thousand to a couple of tens of thousands of write operations per node per second sustained. Um, yeah, and as part of the system, we also have a processing logic container in Java because most applications have some custom logic that they want to run as part of the application and update at the same time that they change their schemas and so on. So we handle the updating of all of this for them. 
And because these systems can be large and consist of hundreds of nodes, um, we have a subsystem that manages the clusters and the nodes and the processes and so on for you, so people don't have to deal with that manually. So as I mentioned, the typical use cases are things like text search, where you want to do uh, natural language relevance and so on, and personalization slash recommendation, where you have some model of the user and some model of your data and you run some machine learn model. But in practice, these systems are often more complicated than that, right? You have, in addition, you often have filters for what data you want to consider in each particular case and so on. And there you combine that with the uh, structured selection in less one and so on. And a third big chunk of use cases are real-time displays where you have a large data collection and you want to display some fancy thing or whatever using, uh, using all that data to end users. So we want to compute that uh, display in real time. Yeah, so another use case that I'm actually allowed to talk about, so I'll just mention it quickly, is a company called Sedge that decided to move all of their serving stuff to Vespa back just after they open source. They were very eager. Um, they spent about a quarter building a new search suggests uh, service for all the searching on Vespa. So doing all that in about a quarter was pretty good. Uh, yeah, they are quite large, but maybe not in the US, I don't know. So where does Vespa fit in the landscape of open source uh, products? As I mentioned, the focus on Vespa is big data serving. Um, so large scale uh, efficiency, support for machine learning models and so on. The closest competitor, so to speak, out there is probably Elasticsearch, but their focus is more on uh, analytics. Um, by the way, this difference becomes very apparent with the, the bigger companies that we talk to that have really large systems. Uh, they all end up building their own custom subsystem to do the real time uh, searching part of their application because they find they can't really uh, do high sustained write rates to their elastic search clusters uh, um, while still serving queries at uh, stable um, latencies. So they end up building some complicated beast with uh, where they search many different things at the same time and so on. And if they use Vespa, they don't need to do any of that because we handle it. Uh, for the text search part, we also overlap with Solo, uh, which focuses more on the enterprise uh, search part of the world. I'll skip the rest because it's quite obvious. Uh, since this is an um, analytics meetup, I'll go into some more detail on the difference uh, between analytics and big data serving. <laughs> Uh, with analytics, the typical user is somebody employed to do whatever they are doing with the data, right? So they can tolerate somewhat higher latency than in our systems. So response times in low seconds are typically uh, the target of these systems. And the query rate is quite low, typically like tens per second or something like that, while the typical query rates that we see are uh, thousands per second. Uh, typically, you only look at time series data, which means you can apply some special optimizations that we can't uh, apply because we support uh, random writes where you update any document and any field in any document at any uh, given time. And you can do that with a high sustain rate. Um, we need high availability because it's for end users, while if you're doing analytics, often you don't care if it's sometimes down because people can grab a cup of coffee and so on and it will be back up. Um, so it sounds like Vespa is better in every respect from this, and that's true, but the flip side is if you have really massive collections like trillions of documents, you can still manage to index that 
pretty cheaply on Elasticsearch, while that starts to become really expensive on Vespa. Right? So it's a trade-off. Uh, the last difference is in what kind of thing uh, there's a focus on integrating with and supporting out of the box and so on. For analytics, it's typically uh, log ingestion, uh, user interfaces, and so on, while for us, it's all about uh, machine learn model support. Yeah, so this is a nice drawing, kind of all the same thing, if you need that. So, brief overview of the architecture of Vespa. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a two tier system. There's a stateless Java container that handles all incoming writes and incoming queries and so on, where all of that is HTTP requests. Um, we run the global part of the processing of queries and so on uh, there as well, which is natively part of Vespa, but applications can also plug in their own logic to process queries, formulate queries from some user input and whatnot, right? Um, then we have what we call content clusters that consist of content nodes that store some partition of data, stores the raw data and also maintains reverse indices, B trees and so on over the data, whatever you need, uh, and executes the distributed part of the computation to answer that particular query. As I mentioned, this is a managed system. So there's a third component, which is the administration subsystem, which sets up these clusters and nodes and so on uh, for you. So what the user sees when they use the system is a higher level abstraction, which is what we call an application package, which describes the clusters you want, the capabilities they should have and so on, uh, and contains any Java components you want to add. If you have that machine learn models, data schemas and so on, then you deploy this to the administration system and that will set up the rest of the system for you. Whenever you want to change your application, you just change the application package, redeploy, and Vespa will seamlessly carry out the change for you without disrupting any of the uh, read or write traffic. So the whole point of Vespa, right, is to achieve computation over large data sets with really low latency. So how do we achieve that? There's three main strategies, which are quite obvious. Uh, the first one is parallelization. When you execute a query, it doesn't execute on a single node, right? It executes on many partitions that have subsets of the data uh, in parallel. And on each of these uh, partition nodes, we execute on multiple cores uh, uh, in parallel as well, and share data um, somewhat between them while we execute <laughs> as necessary. The second main strategy is we move as much of the computation as possible to the content nodes, so we don't need to send the data somewhere for executing machine learning models and so on. Instead, when you deploy your application package, if it contains machine learning models, uh, which needs data and so on. We copy all of that to all of the content nodes. And when we need to evaluate those models, we can do it locally on the local data and in parallel over many nodes, which means you can scale much better than if you need to look up the data and send it to some stateless node for evaluation. And third and last, obviously, because this is in, uh, after all, a search engine, we do. Uh, prepare data structures at the right time to make the uh, queries cheaper. And the prototypical example, of course, is the typical posting list that you have in search engines. But we also do B trees and other data structures depending on the kind of queries you want to support. John, how do you pass this machine learning model? Is it kind of a bytecode or an increment? Yeah, how do we pass the uh, uh, machine learning models to the content nodes? That's an excellent question, actually. Uh, I have some slides that go into it in detail, but I'm not sure I'll get to it, so I'll do it now. Uh, so Vespa has its own uh, built-in native tensor model and tensor mathematical uh, language. So what we do is you can either use that mathematical language directly and just 
write functions or tensors to express your model as part of your configuration and just deploy that. But if you have a mod, if you're training with TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever, it will already output the model in some format and you don't want to manually convert it to some other form, right? So to make that simpler, we support those various uh, model formats out of the box. So you can just save them directly to the application package and deploy it. And in that case, we in here translate to over native mathematical function uh, language. And we just send the configuration in that language over here. And we also distribute the data in forms of global tensors uh, to all the nodes over here, which are the thing called variables, for example, in TensorFlow, which are... Uh, no, we don't do that yet. So we, we run a, for out, we run all our systems in a cloud that we operate and we are doing experiments with GPUs, but so far they haven't been cost effective. And the biggest reason is that we need low latency, so you can't batch too much. And the other is there's typically a high update rate to the data, which is not that good for the GPU. But they are getting better, so eventually we'll uh, go there, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that means we don't use technologies like TensorFlow Serving. We do our own optimized C++ codes in here for this kind of thing, and that is one thing is we can support many different formats and uh, frameworks and so on just by doing translation over here. But the other reason is you want to do different optimizations when you want to evaluate a model over many data points with low latency than if you want to evaluate a more expensive model over a single data point, which is the typical use case for TensorFlow Survey. Uh, Google do the same thing as we do actually, but obviously they're not sharing it. Um, Done with this one. Oh yeah, here's a slide that talks a bit more about inference and uh, tensors. So I'm not your data scientist kind of people, yeah. Yeah, you probably know what a tensor is. For us, a tensor is a multi-dimensional um, um, array of numbers, really. Uh, the fun thing about the tensor model in Vespa is you can name the dimensions and that makes the math much, much nicer. But uh, I won't go into that, but it's really, really nice. Uh, so we have a tensor map where you only have uh, a few functions, actually six, six functions, but mostly it's join, map, and reduce, which takes lambdas. And that allows you to express all kinds of mathematical models that are using higher level functions. Um, so we have a long list of higher level uh, functions as well. You can find them on the documentation page on Vespa books. AI. So here's a excerpt from that page. Here are the uh, high level functions, which are the typical ones that you use in machine learning. And the thing in red here, or magenta or whatever, is the equivalent expression in the uh, low level six functions that we uh, provide in this. Um, it's important for us to reduce it to this simple math. Uh, because it means that we can optimize on this level with only these six functions and patterns of these six functions rather than worrying about the hundreds of functions that you have on a higher level. Right? But as a user, you don't care, you can use the higher level functions directly if you like, or most likely just use one of these tools and save your uh, machine learning model directly to Vespa and deploy it and forget all about this. Yeah. So this was my brief overview. Uh, yeah, I have some more time, so I'll go into some more detail. But uh, to wrap up this overview, um, Vespa is available as open source. You can find it on Vespa.ai. We have a quick start tutorials that you can run on ABS or run on your own laptop, uh, if you like. We also have a nice tutorial in three uh, pieces that starts with you downloading a data set and then building a blog search and personalized recommendation engine from scratch, doing all the steps, including the 
model training and deployment and so on um, on Vespa. So that's pretty nice if you want to learn uh, more about it. Yeah. So I know this is not, you know, this is not necessarily what you need to design for, but often in a, whenever you actually have to kind of do this kind of thing, so that's what the great place kind of designed for. You do it as well. <coughs> Yeah. Right now, support the. Right now, you support the. I guess the the tensor model, but you don't really support the nearest neighbor search natively. I guess really, right? And so I was wondering, if you guys have thought about it? What is the design issues and stuff? Uh, yeah, you mean the typical case is you have vectors, which are tensors, right? And you. Can right, reduce the neighbor nearest neighbor search to the combination. Just, right, you'll yeah. have a bunch of embeddings, and then you'll have basically you yeah. you, do you want to like, do many dot products really fast. Basically, is what it right. boils like down to. Right? Use your product quantization or something like that. Some optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, so before we had the tensor language and this general math, we had special purpose uh, stuff for dot product and vectors for yeah. these kind of use cases specifically. Right. So. You can still use that, but the tensor map is exactly as fast because we recognize when that is what you're doing and then we reduce to the same code. Well, it won't work whenever you have something like 60 million or 100 million mm -hmm. elements. It won't work whenever you have 100 million elements. But like, let's say actually just say, oh, that give works. Yeah. an image and I say, show me the nearest neighbors for yeah. that image, right? So yeah, we do exactly that use case in Flickr. Yeah. Yeah. For 100 millions, it's not that expensive. You can always make it work as long as you pay enough, right? Because you can just add more, <laughs> you can just add more content nodes and it will be as fast as you like, right? But at some point it's too expensive. Right, but if I'm like, I can make it work in Elasticsearch with a, with a CPU nodes uh, using some kind of pro quantization. Yeah, it's possible approach, to make right? it work yeah. there as well. Yeah, so that's it's, sort of it's more work on your part, but it's possible, yeah. But it seems uh, like it's, I would think that it's part of a normal of a, or like a new generation search engine. And I was surprised that you hadn't included that part of that. That we have not included it? Right, because right now you're just basically operating for all of the, all of the tensors. You're not just doing like a, a pro quantization, which basically in a way narrows down to different, to much smaller search uh, yeah. chunks. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's borderline that kind of thing that fits into Vespa uh, or it's deployable. It depends on the data collection you have, how complex you want to do this. If you don't have, if you only have a couple hundred million documents or something, you can just do uh, simple clustering and then find the clusters and that works perfectly well. So we have some applications that do that. We are debating putting that into the platform. In use cases like Flickr, where you have billions and billions of pictures, you want to do something more complex, where they use an algorithm called, uh, some Flickr people are LOPQ or something, which is a two-level quantization where you also do rotating of the axis and whatnot. Uh, there's also actually an open source library that do that, that plugs into uh, Vespa. Huh. But, uh, that's not the kind of code that we in my team wants to um, maintain because it's too sciencey in a way. We're more systems uh, guys. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll skip to my other slides to use my last 15 minutes, I'm not giving them away. Uh, <coughs> So I'll go into some more, just quickly, details about how to actually use Vespa in uh, practice. Oh yeah, I'll mention this as well before we move on because it's a common topic that people have questions about. Um, and another difference from things like Elasticsearch where you think about and care about uh, how you shard the data and Vespa you don't really Think about that, but Vespa obviously does it for you. 
Um, so in Vespa, you configure each of the clusters with uh, virtual nodes, right? And when you write data to it, Vespa will automatically distribute the data over the available nodes um, with the replication factor for the data that you uh, configure. So if you want, if you really don't want to lose data, you have three copies and so on, right? Uh, you can also specify how many groups you want for the data, which is uh, a group is a complete uh, copy of all the content in the cluster on some set of nodes. And having multiple groups allows you to, allows Vespa to automatically route a single query to just a single group rather than to all the nodes, right? So that allows you to scale to hundreds or thousands of queries per second. Uh, where the fixed factor per query per node becomes an important cost factor, then that's when you want to do the grouping. Whenever you change, the, change these things or a node dies or whatever, Vespa automatically redistributes the data in the background uh, while you're serving and handling the writes and so on. So all that happens automatically for you and you never really have to think about it. So we, in my team, we have a Vespa cloud for the company with about 140 applications where people change these things all the time. And we don't have any ops people. We have about a half an ops person that do ops for all of this. So we can't really require any manual operations or cleanup or whatever for any of this. It just has to work. So we have made sure it has done that. Years of work, but uh, now it works really, really well. Um, yeah, so that was that point. Um, if you want, yeah, some technical detail about how it works as well. We use a Zookeeper, small Zookeeper cluster that runs on the same nodes to do the, uh, to make singular decisions about which nodes are up and down. And that gives us a shared global view across all the nodes about both the configured state and the current state as decided by the Zookeeper cluster. Based on those two pieces of information, we feed to an algorithm called Crush, which from that can compute uh, with no other input where each piece of data should reside uh, on the system. So that computation can be done locally by all the nodes and that's the basis for the data distribution and data loop as well. Yeah. What sort of tools do you use? Yeah, so um, actually we can go to a slide on that. Uh, so you use HTTP typically to call uh, Vespa. If you want to write a document, you can just post it as an HTTP, HTTPS uh, post request. And the document is just a bunch of fields, right? You can have binary fields by base 64 encoding and, and so on. And then you can do get to the same documents and you can query and so on. So this is good for simple usage, or if you have lots and lots of clients, for example, if you do writes or updates to your documents from uh, thousands of front-end nodes, this is the way to do it. Uh, and you can update single fields uh, as well, which is typically much faster than updating everything. Right? But if you want to feed with really high throughput, then um, HTTP is not very suitable. So we have a standalone Java client that does that for you by multiplexing our many HTTP channels uh, in parallel and chunking up the responses it get back uh, and so on. So if you want to feed with maximum throughput, that's uh, what you want to use. Do you plan for any integration Are we planning for integration with other stuff for writing? So we have integration out of the box with uh, Hadoop for writing. So you can use Vespa as a data whatever it's called in Hadoop. There's a plugin you can write directly to Hadoop, but it ends up in Vespa. Uh, Kafka, I've written the pseudo codes in Kafka to so many people now that, yeah, that will probably happen soon uh, because it will be faster to just support it. 
other than that, uh, no more plans, no. Um, yeah, so if you want to install Vespa, what you do, we dis, uh, distribute RPM packages and Docker images. Uh, we do new releases to all our production systems uh, about four times a week. And those releases are the ones, the same ones that, that goes out to um, publicly. So they, up, they change pretty fast, but they are always uh, highly tested in production by the time you see them. So they are uh, pretty good quality. Uh, when you install, all nodes have the same packages or the same image, and it's up to Vespa what different roles the nodes will have based on what you say in your application package. So the only thing you do on the nodes, you install this packages and you set a single config variable that points to the configuration subsystem of Vespa and the rest is handled by Vespa. Um, so the configuration you see as a, Vespa, uh, as a user is what we call an application package as I mentioned. Uh, so everything goes into the application package and there's a command line tool for deploying the application package to Vespa. Uh, you can also do it or HTTP if you like. Um, almost all changes can happen to live systems, so they just happen when you do Vespa deploy activate. You don't need to restart anything or anything like that, but there's a few things like changing ports and so on that uh, requires restart. You can also change the Java code you have without restarting. Yeah? Is there support for uh, experimentation with multiple versions of a Yes, there's support for multiple, uh, for experimentation, typically bucket testing and things like that. Yes, we have support for it because you can have multiple models, multiple versions of models, multiple versions actually of the same code even running at the same time. We don't have like a bucket test uh, framework where you define it. It's just that you can have as many things as you like and name them and version them as you like. And then typically the, a B testing tools and so on are further up the value chain and it's just a parameter going down to uh, the best layer that chooses uh, some of these things. Yeah. So what's in an application package? The, we can go to a minimal one in uh, completeness. So you need a file called services that just lists the clusters that you want and they're uh, capabilities. In this case, we have a cluster that should have search middleware, should have the document API, and have these nodes, just a single node, and a content cluster that has some redundancy factor for all the data, uh, a list of document types, and a list of nodes, and that's all. And then you need to point to actual host names for these uh, node aliases in a separate file, and then Last, you need your schemas, which is just a collection of fields that have some settings for each of the fields, which I won't go into now. And here you also have the, what we call rank profiles, which contains the expressions that actually tells you what to compute when you're uh, searching this. And you can have as many of these as you like, and they can be pointed to different files and uh, whatnot when it gets complicated, which these things typically do. I think you were first. So do you support Google Cloud? No, we don't, not yet. So we probably will. Uh, so we have, a, in addition to Oath, we have another company that is pre probably a larger user in Japan. And they want to use Google Cloud, so we probably need to support it. Actually, the Sedge use case, which I mentioned earlier, is also deploying in Google Cloud, but they did it on their own using Kubernetes and Google Cloud. So apparently that wasn't too hard either. But we are planning on providing a public hosted solution uh, for this. And eventually that will be in all the three big clouds because there's always some big company that can only be in one of them because the other two are competitors. You need to be in all three, but the first one will be ABS because we already are in ABS uh, for some of the internal use cases. 
Yeah. Uh, question about storage. Uh, do you have any uh, requirements for decision that, oh, I have to consider storage where my most popular search query will be run and I have some SSDs and I have some disks? Yeah. Do you have this mix of uh, topologies and how do you rank where, which document goes where in terms of the shopping itself? It's possible to do these things because you can have many component clusters and use different flavors of nodes and so on, but we don't. You don't reorganize things based on. We don't do it automatically for them. We don't recommend it because it's typically better to have uh, even mix of all kinds of data on uh, all the nodes and then use the mechanisms built into Vespa to make sure that the hottest data is always. Uh, closest to the CPU, which is will do for you out of the box. So I believe there's an assumption that everything is in memory or is it No, it's not an assumption. No. So how do you decide what document goes on each of these and what state you are? Well that's just based on the what's actually being looked up in queries. Mostly there's also field level settings for this. Uh, like some fields you want to have always available in memory, so you mark them as attributes, you can do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned most of this. There was one more thing I wanted to mention, but uh, what was it? Oh yeah, I wanted to show the um, ONX and so on integration because many people are interested in that. So we added support, as I mentioned, for TensorFlow, but there are other tools out there as well, like PyTorch and so on. And all these other tools have agreed on a single serialized form of their models called ONX. So we also support that. So if you use any of these tools, you can just save your model directly into the Vespa application package just in a directory called models, and that's it. And then you can reference them like this, just using the name of the kind of model and the path to the model, and optionally the function and output if you have um, more of those, and that just works out of the box. And the nice thing is we can optimize even across these functions, right? Because they all get translated to the same language. And that that's the kind of deep optimizations that you really want to do. You want to look at the whole expression more backwards because the way it's typically expressed is you translate a tensor to some other tensor and so on, but eventually you collapse it down to something really small. And if you work backwards, then you don't need to uh, write as much memory for intermediate structures. So that's pretty nice. Okay, I don't think we have time for anything more. If you have more questions, feel free to find me and shoot me a question. These decks are also public, so I can share the uh, Google Doc links uh, if you like. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.